Thank you, I'm Patrick Tucker, Technology Editor for Defense One, and uh, we have a fantastic discussion about weaponizing different uh, aspects of biology to join you at lunch today. Um, <laughs> With me uh, is Dr. Gaiman Bennett. He's Assistant Professor of Religion, Science, and Technology at Arizona State University. Uh, Dr. Gary Merchant, the Lincoln Professor of Emerging Technologies in Law and Ethics, also at ASU. And Dr. Michael Crow, who's the president of uh, ASU. So the topic of, that we're discussing today, how will digital biology uh, transform conflict? So. Who here today thinks they have a good understanding of what digital biology is? Raise your hand, you ambitious people. No. OK. What is digital biology? Start there. I'll jump in first. Yeah, go. Uh, digital biology, like a lot of new scientific brands, means many things to many people. OK. Um, but maybe we could uh, name three flavors of it, at least. Mm -hmm. um, the first is what we might call old school digital biology, uh, emerged in the 1990s with the genome projects. Um, that was a time in the life of molecular biology in which um, just drives in computer technology made things possible in biology that weren't possible before, including creating kind of dependencies in everyday lab life mm -hmm. um, between what you, what you do at the bench and the need to organize what you do at the bench on a computer just because there's so much data. Okay. The goal there was basically can you move from biology to bits to biology. Mm -hmm. um, now we're in a kind of next generation of digital biology, which is can you move from bits to biology to bits? That is to say, can you use computers to design new living systems? Can you produce those living systems in your lab? And then can you uh, upload that information uh, on the internet for other people to be able to play with the things that you've built? Using digital, using information technology and the power that that uh, is available to us to uh, take what we know about biology and essentially create new forms of, of biology is an aspect of what you just described. Is that fair? Right. Uh, the sort of outside goal of second generation digital biology is something like computer aided design. Okay. Can you know enough about living systems to understand how their function works? in relationship to the biological underpinnings, and can you build a computer-aided design program that encodes um, the biological functions such that you could design a, a new living system without really having to know very much about the underlying biology. Is there a difference between that and what uh, is popularly now being called synthetic biology? Uh, there's a lot of overlap, and okay. certainly synthetic biology for the last 10 years has been one of the sources and drivers for what could be called digital biology. Okay. Um, it's been a kind of brand that's attracted people from outside of biology, like computer engineers and physicists, into biology mm -hmm. to begin to think about how biological systems work on the model of digital systems. Uh, that's created a whole set of new opportunities in biotechnology. It also raises the question of a kind of limit of how far you can take analogies. So one of the big questions in molecular biology is, can you think about living systems like computer systems, and how far will that get you scientifically? Can you think of living systems the way we think about computer systems, and where do we? So we're not, when we talk about synthetic biology, we're not necessarily talking about growing, you know, like gigantic monsters with like huge hands to go and take our enemies and throw them like the Hulk or something like that. We're talking about uh, developing new um, organisms or perhaps even just taking solutions that exist in nature and applying them to real world problems. These are, I guess, some of the things that um, present themselves as the potentials within the uh, digital biology space, what will this do for us in 10 years? What are we going to get as a result of the digital biology revolution in 10 years? You know, I, th I think the way to, to look at these things, and long before I was a university president, I was a professor of science and technology policy thinking about where science and technology systems would take us in a, in a sort of futuristic kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, um, the way to look at this is not so much the details of what digital biology will allow. You have to assume that with the binary code that we've mastered and we have computational engines that can calculate at whatever increasing speed we can calculate, that ultimately that speed will uh, continue to accelerate on a log logarithmic basis. You match that with now the mastery that we have of digital instruction systems called DNA, which are reducible to four uh, coded items. You have then six. Uh, items, four letters in the way that we're using them and two numbers in the way that we're using them. Mm -hmm. If you can compute at whatever speed you want to compute and you can move those things around in a sets of instructions to be able to re-engineer anything, therefore you can engineer anything from that. And what that means then in the spirit of Craig Venter's idea of life at the speed of light, you have then the following thing that you need to think about and that is individuals ultimately being empowered to create 
physical, biological systems capable of performing any function you'd like them to perform. Hmm. And transporting them and moving them in whatever way you'd like to transport and move them uh, at relatively uh, low cost. Right. So this uh, is this without is, major facilities. And so that's the thing that you need to think about. Right. So when we, we, this is a great example. So now, now we know who a digital biologist is in sort of the real world. Craig Venter is an example of someone doing uh, di digital biology and creating synthetic biology solutions. Uh, now and his project. At least as of May 2010. That's, yeah, that's, what, that's fair, what he fair. says he did. So. All right. Well. Well, his project right now is, is, is unique when it's related uh, directly to, to what we're talking about. He's, he's looking for um, the creation of a new type of algae that can be used as a, as a fuel. Um, algae is a lipid. It's a, it's a, you can use an olive press and you can get a burnable fuel from it, but it's also uh, extremely nitrogen hungry. It, it requires a lot of nutrients to grow, and this is a, a big barrier to turning it into a, a really cost-effective fuel solution. And so. Um, if you can synthetically engineer a new type of algae, if this is an ongoing military project within the Navy um, as well, uh, then you can basically run your huge energy-hungry uh, battleships and all of your equipment and your entire economy on um, pond scum, in addition to um, basically feeding it to people because it's extremely protein-rich. So I've talked to, this is, this, so when we talk about what this could result from this, this is a great example. Um, I spoke to a, a NASA scientist, um, Dennis Bushnell, he's head of the uh, research facility at Langley. And uh, in addition to being a rocket scientist in his spare time, he uh, talks a lot about uh, energetics, like that's what he does over there. And uh, he pointed out that uh, uh, you can create a type of algae that um, can be irrigated with salt water. You can grow it in uh, parts of Africa that we today consider wasteland, and you can create economic opportunity in that place. Uh, that has never existed before by creating a viable food crop, a fuel crop, just to completely economically transform this place. Is this realistic within the next 10 years? For, not necessarily for algae, but more broadly as a result of the digital biology revolution? Oh, in 10 years, no, but I think the way to look at this, though, is this, you know, we've sort of lived through the, the century of, of physics with uh, Einstein and quantum this and quantum that and physical systems and so forth, and while all of that is continuing, mm -hmm. biology now is evolving at an even quicker rate as a, as a fundamental area of knowledge than physics uh, evolved, and that's leading us to the point now where you can conceptualize what you just said, mm -hmm. which is uh, being able to transform or engineer life forms to perform whatever function we want them to perform, to produce whatever chemical output, physical output, whatever it is that you'd like them to produce, they could then have the capacity to, to do that in relatively short order. The extent to which one can move to what you're describing, which is a photonic driven, a photon driven economy where you're taking the photons from the sun, most of which are wasted mm -hmm. uh, on the earth, most of which are reflected or wasted, and you're take, converting those photons into electrons as you want to use them, into molecules as you want to use them through a plant or an engineered plant or biological system. Mm. All of those things are the, are the way in which everything's going to change from from what we eat to where we get it to how it grows to how we grow it to how we fight to how we fight it to how we move forward, all, everything will change. And so the notion is not so much the details mm -hmm. of the change, it's understanding that our ability to transform information and to calculate from the tools that we have whatever transformative outcome we want is accelerating so quickly that you have to be able to anticipate and expect anything, positive or negative. Okay. Positive would be food production enhancements or medical production enhancements from microorganisms or, or larger scale organisms that we're, that we're driving forward uh, in places that have access to nothing uh, like that right now to the negative side of that, which is the design construction and, and distribution of things that are not so good for us. That's you can kind of say, you look at the algae industry and you sort of see these three generations of products that I think is symbolic of the broader life sciences revolution of the first generation of just taking this enormous biodiversity that's out there already. Right. There's already thousands of strains of microalgae and so on that people have been collecting and, and testing and seeing if they can make products in them. Mm -hmm. And now, right now, we're now genetically engineering algae where we're adding in genes or mutating genes or moving them from one species to another. And then the next generation, which is we're now moving towards and what people like Craig Venter are talking about is, is basically designing those algae from the ground up. Mm -hmm. uh, that the naturally occurring variations that we can move between species now is not enough power, we basically have to basically create them from scratch. And right. that's the whole stepwise progression all the life sciences are going in right now. Okay. Can I just, yeah, sorry, we'll don't stay too long in this question, but flag two other things. 
Um, first of all, with regard to the challenges of producing a fuel out of um, biology, algae, or, or switchgrass, or whatever it is, um, the biggest variable right now is not the biological difficulty. The biggest variable are the economics mm -hmm. of uh, petroleum-based fuels and, and the cycles of investment in advanced biotechnology relative to how feasible it is for a number of reasons. Um, second, um, right now it's still a big open question of how you begin to farm something like algae because of questions of environmental impact. So that's still right. being worked out and that's a big issue. Right. And a third um, variable in all of this, which I think is really crucial to the question of the future of conflict, which is the major biological breakthroughs around things like engineering and algae for biofuels isn't even necessarily the end product you get. It's the little techniques along the way that you're beginning to perfect that allow you to do more powerful work, mm -hmm. more reliably, um, at less expense, right. which means then the barrier to access for people doing these things goes down. So just the example of the Venture Institute's work on algae, um, the big threshold was Dan Gibson produced a means by way of which you could take a set of st uh, strands of DNA, you could put them in a single pot, and they would anneal together in a way that was correct and func uh, functionally robust. Yeah. That used to take lots and lots of steps and lots and lots of money and lots and lots of expertise. So the so-called Gibson method is born, right. and within a few months, labs all over the world are using the Gibson method. So these not very sexy little techniques, sort of just below the surface, are really what are driving capacity across domains. Okay, so we, we've established so far um, that the uh, Digital biology is something that's uh, highly established, that the potential is enormous, that the uh, uh, ability to work with it is expanding as uh, exponentially quickly as is Moore's law in the realm of information science. The barriers Fat, faster of, than Moore's law. The barriers of entry and accessibility are, are going down as quickly. So when do we get weaponized Ebola? Later, rather than soon. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do, uh, though? I mean, if... if, if, if the costs of accessibility keep going down. The potential is insists that there was going to be a, a wide diffusion of, of, of different people all around the world that are going to be doing cutting edge research, no longer just in big university labs, but in garages and in, in hacker spaces and things like this. If this is the same trajectory that was, you know, sort of like the hacker space is going to become the biohacker space, three things. What can we do to keep that uh, from very quickly becoming as big a mess? Uh, security-wise, as is uh, the internet for a lot of people. So I think, I think one thing we have, and let me know if you guys disagree, but I think we have time, and, uh, because I think it's going to be a lot slower than we think. Someone once said that you know, we, we tend to overestimate the power of technologies in the short term and underestimate their powers in the long term. That's certainly the case in this area. You know, biology is hard uh, compared to mechanical or chemical or digital or cyber technologies or systems where you can control and manipulate them so much easier. Biology is really hard because it evolves, it interacts, it grows, it's by definition living. And to make stable biological systems that do what you want to do is extremely challenging and difficult. So the backyard, you know, the garage or the basement uh, DIYer isn't going to produce a, a powerful biological weapon any time in the next 10 years. Uh, they maybe, you know, they'll put something on a salad bar somewhere and kill a couple of people possibly, and that would be a tragedy. But in terms of a national security threat, I don't see it in the next few years. So I, I think I, in the long term it is huge, but not right now. I, I, think, I think Gary's making a, a, a brilliant point, and that is that you know, when the physicists at Alamogordo uh, fell to the ground in July of 1945, you know, weeping, saying, my God, what have we done? They hadn't had enough foresight or thought about the nuclear weapons that they, that they had been party to designing. And when the physicists later tried to pull back the genie that they'd let out of the bottle, they were frustrated that it was too late. It was already out of the bottle. In biology, I agree with Gary that the, we now can see from our physical past what we are capable of doing. We're now empowered on a biological front for which the consequences are even greater mm -hmm. because we are biological and thus uh, uh, interruptible in, in interesting ways biologically. And so perhaps the way to deal with the concept of conflict, which is conflict avoidance, conflict uh, uh, resolution, and so forth, is to take a completely new approach to avoid a future war built around biological systems as opposed to physical systems by thinking about all of the design issues that we should put on the table right now relative to how to manage this particular area of science unlike how we didn't manage physics. Right. Physics was unmanaged and you can see where that got us. 
Biology has now got more potential to have both positive and negative outcomes than physics for a lot of reasons. We have the, the foresight and the potential wisdom to be able to manage it to avoid conflict yeah. by, by, in a sense, you could even code it in certain ways. You could design certain things where certain outcomes are not possible, but you have to be able to think about that right now at the outset. Well, I think that this, this town is founded on the notion that human beings are going to disagree about management. I mean, that's what this is. This is a big town that, that manages things. And this, this, this issue is already creeping into the debate about what to do with, uh, with biology. Here's an example. In, in January of 2012, a team from the University of Wisconsin found that the presence of uh, lysine in the 627 position of the P2B protein essentially made H5N1 an aerial uh, weapon. It, it, it allowed it to exist in the hotter lungs of ferrets and mammals. Um, and that was a big change. That means it's very dangerous. It can be passed aerially. That research was funded by the government, but there was a big fight in Congress to um, uh, basically restrict it. To, uh, there was a moratorium on, on publication and even to defund different research like that. So and there's a moratorium right. right now on that research. Right. Right. And, and there's a self-imposed moratorium among many scientists, including many at our own institution, yeah. that won't engage in certain kinds of research because of what the results could mean. So that means that no one's going to engage in them? So it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that, but there's ways to advance this in a different way where, where you can think through the process about how to guide science to certain outcomes, which is considered heresy by most scientists to think about the notion of guiding science. So you're self, you're self arresting though, um, you're, you're self relinquishing, but we can't, how do we create a, a, a space where everyone follows that? Right. It seems Sorry. to me that, yeah. that um, the H5N1 is a great example of a number of things we've been talking about, the H5N1 affair. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it took both the guys in Wisconsin and Ron Fouchier's lab, um, yeah. uh, who was the other scientist who did this, it took them specialized facilities, many years, millions of dollars, lots of expertise. Mm -hmm. Um, but once you publish the sequences, it takes far less capacity to be able to reproduce what they, what they do. Right. So although Gary's right that things in biology remain much more difficult to do than what often gets talked about, say, around DIY bio, mm -hmm. um, it, it is the case that things are getting easier. The bar is going down. So once they've done that work, it would take a competent technician a few thousand dollars in a few weeks to reproduce what they've done because they have the sequences online. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is, one of the questions I think we need to ask moving forward um, around the management of these new technologies mm -hmm. um, is how do we shift from a frame of containment um, to, the, to a framework of the fostering of the ethics of responsibility among um, practicing scientists. This That's is part of what I meant. That's the code into the actual machines, individuals, science, the process itself. These abilities, like is in, the, in the case of Isaac Asimov's you know, notion of robotics, you know, there's this notion that the robot can never be designed to injure a human. That's hey. like no joke. That's not a science fiction thing. That's a code inside the model. You saw one of the big blockages in the H5N1 affair was precisely the ethics of the researchers who were doing the gain-of-function research. Mm -hmm. They were part of an ethical community which, um, for better or for worse, really understood what they were doing as, if you will, salvational. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were engineering these strains in order to save lives. Um, but that culture didn't have attached to it um, a kind of sobriety around the question of, when you bring powerful new things into the world, what kind of responsibility comes with it? And so the attempt to critique that work often met with a kind of stonewall among some of those researchers that what they were doing was always inevitably good, and the only harm that could come from it would be so-called misuse. Um, but that belies then, I think t for me, it belies the insufficiency of, of a kind of culture of ethical responsibility within the laboratory, which asks quite seriously this question, when we create powerful new things that we hope bring uh, good to the world, how do we also set into motion things which might be problematic? It also raises, so there's two really key questions it raises that go beyond that specific example. So one is, do we do the experiments? And as Dr. Crow mentioned, you know, some, a lot of researchers are saying, we don't think these are ethical. But in the military context, I think it's a huge dilemma for, say, our military, because um, if, if we, we know that there's going to be people out there who won't follow those same self-imposed restrictions, 
to understand what those threats are and to be able to counter them, do we have to create the monster ourselves? And I think that's a huge dilemma, yeah. uh, whether we have to do that or not, to know how to, to defend ourselves and to know what's possible. And you could argue that both ways, but I think that's a huge issue, uh, that, that particularly from a military national security context is there. And then the second one is when we do this stuff, do we publish it? And that's what the H H5N1 got uh, wrapped up in is, you know, does the government or does journal editors or the scientists themselves decide not to publish this stuff? And again, that's uh, this whole issue of open access, maybe again knowing about this and, and having a community of scientists who are well-meaning to understand this would argue in favor of more publication, whereas that also creates a risk that other people will see it that, that would use it for, more, for nefarious purposes. So those two issues of should we be doing the monsters ourselves, and then secondly, when we do this research and find this stuff, should we make it open access? So, so one of the ways to sort of think this through is who would have imagined that digital biology would transform conflict, not immediately, but eventually, in ways well beyond anything we've ever experienced as a species because we've never really had uh, you know, genetic weapons, or we've never really had things targeting particular groups or whatever, we've never had anything like that, and all of that's possible. Uh, but now imagine that we, we, we avoid conflict in the future by rethinking how we do science now, to not take away any of the notion of the fundamental discovery aspect of things, but this notion of a, of a tool that we've been working on at ASU in our, in our Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, which is a tool called Real-Time Technology Assessment where you start thinking through, and this is really hard, and we're just at the, you know, we're not even a, an infant yet. We're still just sort of conceptualizing how you would do this. How would you think about the implications of a technology at the time that it became scientifically feasible? feasible yeah. Not doable, but feasible. How would you think through all of the implications, and then how would you then guide the evolution of the technology so that you do not get these unbelievably inalterable, unrecoverable outcomes which you know, could affect the outcome of the entire species. That's what's at scale. The counter argument actually comes from the scientists themselves. Science, once it is guided in any possible way, will not produce the results that have produced so many positive things for us. Well, we can line up all of the positives that have come from physics and all of the negatives that have come from physics and they are complicated in their outcomes. The biological outcomes, the biologically based uh, conflicts of the future uh, would be uh, wild by comparison. I'll wipe out your food supply, I'll wipe out your water, I'll wipe out your ability to reproduce, I'll wipe out your ability for your gene line to advance, I'll do this, I'll do this. I mean, I don't know how those kinds of conflicts will be dealt with, but it would be better to sort of confront them now yeah. before they're feasible by rethinking how we do certain other things. So one of, it sounds like one of the things you're, you're saying is that in order to really feel safe from the um, terrifying potential of, of uh, uh, synthetic biology in the years ahead, we have to reach for a cultural change in sort of the way science is done and also the way the military seeks uh, strategic advantage. Because the military never wants to be in a fair fight. Everyone will say this. Fair fights are dumb, not for us. We don't want it. And the entire nature of scientific exploration is uh, we will feel free to explore. We must have that you know, freedom. And if we're going to produce results that aren't you know, pre-programmed in. So we have to change both science and entire military culture in order to be safe from digital biology? And, and simulations will And Congress and legislation, too, and everything. Because, I mean, the, the way Washington works is exactly the opposite of what Dr. Crow just said, what they're trying to do with real-time technology assessment. It's to wait till the problem is already manifesting. You've got a huge problem. And, and, and then you try to fix it after the fact. And we do that in environment and yeah. safety so, and all, everything. Yes, so you have to change uh, Washington, too. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but so, but so, but so, so <laughs> those, those kinds of things, so I, I, my, my brain doesn't go very far on those kinds of things. Like, you know, somehow, so we have to change this, we have to change that. Everything changes. Everything always has changed. Right. Everything changes dramatically as a function of new, each new input to the system. The thing that you have to decide is whether or not you're going to be involved in intelligent design or random design. So we have all these changes, mm -hmm. many of which are the product of random design. Right. Th that is the things that we're faced with, the things that we're interacting, the way that we're working. So this notion of can we think about change in a way where it is a product of somehow intelligent forethought, even if it's only limited intelligent forethought, can you get a better net-net outcome to reduce a potential threat and thus certain conflicts by moving in that direction? And the answer would be, I hope so. Yeah. Because otherwise, randomness, random design, with these kinds of technological capabilities in the hands of X people, 
the, the, the outcome is, is, is the threat index is so high mm -hmm. that it means we have to change, even if it's hard. Who cares if it's hard? That doesn't mean anything. You just have to do it. We have to figure out some way to rethink this stuff before we can no longer think about it. All right, in the, in the time we have left, let's um, open up to questions, and then we'll shoot right to you. Go ahead. Who has a question in the audience about? There we go. Yes, Spark. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Sharon Burke with New America. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the state of play with the innovation globally and also the state of play with the moral dimensions you're talking about globally? Um, are these concerns shared? And even if we don't create monsters, are those monsters already being created somewhere else? Now give us a sense of how this looks globally. So one thing um, that I do a lot of my work in is looking at sort of non-traditional governance that goes beyond legislation and regulation because the problem with legislation and regulation is it applies to jurisdictions, whereas some other types of uh, mechanisms can apply much more broadly across international borders by things like codes of conduct and other types of things that are done by scientists and other organizations that basically aren't limited to jurisdictions. So I think a lot of the interesting developments is, is to try to, uh, is, is a number of initiatives to look at things like, uh, you know, industry code of conduct of, of screening DNA synthesis sequences that's being applied by these voluntary programs that go beyond the United States to internationally. Now there's still, you know, one in Russia and one somewhere else that maybe not playing along with that, so you're still going to get some bad actors. But uh, this idea of moving from a national system to an international because it's an international problem. If someone has a terrorist weapon you know, in Belgium, it makes just as much difference as if it's in the United States, if it gets to you know, ISIS or whoever. So uh, to look at new models that basically uh, apply things like anticipatory uh, anticipation and, and try to real-time anticipation and try to do it across national borders and international. Well, yeah, let's, so this is a good point for gaming too. Like how worried are you about um, some of these places internationally and what they're doing. Are we, should we be worried about what synthetic biology looks like in Russia? Should we be worried about what it looks like in the hands of a Donetsk separatist? I mean, what is, I don't know. Be... I don't know that we should be worried about scientists um, in Russia or China more than scientists in the United States. I don't, I don't okay. know what basis on which we would make that kind of a judgment. Okay. But I would say two things with regard to the question, the, the global dimension and the, the moral dimension. Mm -hmm. First, since the 1990s and the, the publication of um, uh, protocols in molecular biology, mm -hmm. publication that shares how to do what you want to do, um, the question of governing biology through restriction was basically out the window. So knowledge and know-how is everywhere. Um, U.S. institutions are still the very best. Uh, lots of biology still uh, learned through tacit knowledge in the lab, and, and the top institutions in the United States are still the best institutions in the world. Um, but uh, knowledge and know-how um, is everywhere, basically, for any number of reasons. Okay, so then um, the moral question. So for about six years, I lived in labs as a kind of in-house ethicist, as an as an attempt to get upstream of some of the moral questions. Can you uh, rationally design the way in which synthetic biology is headed? Um, limited success, success in that experiment in that um, we learned what we could do and what was uh, less possible to do. Um, but we kept running into the problem of just the intransigent for forces of how institutions work, um, how people are pursuing their careers, how they can get their funding, which companies are going to be interested in what they're doing, those, those questions trump. Last twist on this, uh, on the moral question. To the extent to which synthetic biology uh, or advanced biotechnology, whatever you want to call it, moves outside of familiar institutional settings, the question of how you govern the ethos of those settings is going to be a wide open one. Um, we might look to things like the growth of the hacker culture in computer science, but we don't know really whether or not a, a so-called garage biologist will uh, share some of the, as it were, political ethos of the hacker culture. So this question, once this moves out of the major institutional settings, and it's moving outside of the major institutional settings, um, what will be the techniques by way of which we can foster an ethics of responsibility? I, I think what I would add on the moral question is that um we face the moral dilemma of our scientific capability outstripping our cognitive skills. Uh, and so we're, we're moving faster in our knowledge relative to what we can do scientifically than 
in how we make decisions or how we should govern this or not govern that. And so one of the things I think that, that, that people don't completely grasp on the question of morality, and I'll, I'll go to Phil Kitcher, uh, a philosopher, a philosopher of biology, who uh, basically wrote in his book, uh, Science, Truth, and Democracy, that science being pursued without a defined objective is amoral. It's not immoral. It can become immor immoral, but it is amoral. And he argues vociferously against the notion of pursuing science without an outcome as your objective because of how it might ultimately be used. So imagine, and this is very hard to conceptualize, biologists who now are advancing on biology realizing that one of the things that they have to do along the way is as they advance from science to technology, they must find ways to ensure to the extent possible that weapons or other nefarious outcomes from these technologies might be at least minimized or somehow understood or protected against. That's a completely different way about thinking about science and it requires us to move to a modality for science very different than the present design that we have. So the design that we have was laid down by Vannevar Bush in 1945 in Science the Endless Frontier which is this open-ended all things are good, all outcomes are good. Well, we know all things are not good, and all outcomes are not good. But we need, a, we need a much more sophisticated way to think about the moral basis under which we approach science, and that's what's missing right now. It's, a, it's still a discussion, it's not, a, it's not an action-oriented agenda. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman, thank, thank you for a very interesting panel. I have more of an observation I'd like you to respond to. Uh, some 40 years ago, a very chilling novel called White Plague was published in which the author, who was a biologist, engineered, and the DNA was pretty accurate, a disease that killed off 90% of the female population in the world with all sorts of effects. If you haven't read the book, it's interesting to go back. The other part of my observation is we've had cyber since Marconi more than 100 years ago, yet we still don't know what a cyber declaration of war would be required. And it's taken us a very, very long time. So what would you suggest ways to come up with some kind of a system of governance or at least anticipation of what the consequences are so that we don't get into a similar position um, as we have been with cyber where we have this interesting issue about which we really don't have a code of conduct or any kind of a deterrent framework? Well, let me uh, um, tag onto that. The Geneva Conventions that prohibit the use of uh, biological agents in formal warfare between formal parties um, there's a lot of uh, non-state actors that don't feel like the Geneva Convention really applies to them. Is this still an adequate uh, international framework for the uh, relinquishment of the development of biological weapons? And if not, what would you replace it with? Well, see, I, I don't think there is one instrument. And so in this area, people talk about a web of prevention, that, it, that, that you might have some international treaties, you might have statutes that protect you know, access to select agents and so on, but you have to have a lot of other things as well. You have to have uh, standards and codes of conduct that are uh, international. You have to have the technology solutions. That Dr. Scientists was, trained in a different way. That's right, the education mm -hmm. of the scientists and, and the ethical uh, training of, of scientists. And, the, and all those things together is what gives us our best hope. It's, it's, it's flimsy and it's you know, unsatisfactory in so many ways, but it's better than anything else. And, and so it's a combination of many different instruments and tools that includes international law, but uh, includes domestic law and a lot of other things as well. I think one of the difficulties is if you're working on f fundamental questions in biology and right. even in synthetic biology where it's so application oriented, people are still solving some pretty basic problems. It feels like there's such a distance between what you're doing in the lab and the kinds of impacts it will have in the world um, that, it's, that I think that a real challenge is how do you get young biologists to get in their guts this feeling like biology should never be used for harm. Um, analogy to the way in which doctors are trained. If doctors are inculcated with a sensibility that I ought not do harm, that mm -hmm. I ought to be using um, uh, my capacities to save people's lives, uh, how do you begin to foster that same kind of deeply ingrained ethic among um, biologists and biotechnologists, especially when it's impossible to draw a straight line between what they're doing at the bench and the kinds of impacts it will have on the world. And, and a culture that is presently organized to take no responsibility for the implementation of what they develop by someone else. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we just did the science, someone else made it bad. 
Uh, and so it's, it's a really, really complicated outcome. I, when I was at Columbia University uh, in the 1990s as a professor, I taught uh, students who were required to take a course if they received funding from the NIH, they were required to take a course on, in a sense, the ethics of research and their role in research. And it was a, one of my worst experiences in my teaching at Columbia uh, because <laughs> the students didn't want to take the course. They thought that it was completely, utterly a waste of their time. They, they, their responsibility was to do good science. What happened to their science was someone else's responsibility. And so there's this, this lack of connection <coughs> between the notion of the scientist and what they're ultimately responsible for. Yeah. And we have not even conceived of the mechanism by which you do not thwart the finding of the fundamental operations of nature, while at the same time giving responsibility to the scientists. We haven't figured that out yet, but we, we need to. Another question. I'm Mark Hagrod at the Naval Academy Cyber Center uh, with the other contingent here of the Naval Academy. If I could play with that title for a second and ask the panel to comment on what it was, how will the digital biology revolution transform our warriors, like this midshipman sitting in front of me? It seems that that's going to be where it hits first when we begin to ask them to modify for battlefield performance. Uh, and I would submit, is this maybe the first step for arms control that we don't require any military member across the world to be subject to modification for battlefield performance. So, open question. Well, that's definitely not the path that we're on right now. Mm -hmm. we're, so, on the, we're on the path of maximum modification in, in whatever way necessary to produce uh, whatever type of warriors necessary to advance. And the number of projects that are underway in that realm are, are significant and many. And so these go back to this notion of us not being sufficiently outcome in the long run, outcome oriented enough to think through all the consequences of where we're, of where we're headed. And uh, uh, I, I went to, my PhD program was in an area called science and technology policy and every week for the years that I was there, on Tuesdays we had the technology run amok movie. And it was always about, you know, the, the soldier who was genetically altered who then, you know, the Jason Bourne syndrome or the, or the whatever, you know, it would be the modern versions of this. And so, Hollywood has done a good job of showing us what some of these outcomes are, and we all pay to go to these movies, and they seem really interesting. Okay, well, at some point, they'll actually be real. Uh, and so one has to think that through. I think we're already in a gray zone on some of this, so just pick an example which seems innocuous. Um, there are a number of efforts going on right now to use microbiology to produce the precursors, uh, precursor chemicals to make munitions. It's scalable. It seems like it's much more environmentally sound than using synthetic chemistry to do these things. Um, but it opens the door, not to the violation of things like the, um, the Biological Warfare Convention, but it opens the door to allowing um, young biologists to practice their biology in a way that ultimately is oriented toward military outcomes. Okay, so we can have a conversation about um, whether or not that's good or not and under what conditions we should do that. But um, as we begin to move these capacities forward, um, it's uh, toward um, deliberate use for, for military ends. I think one of the questions is going to be how do we continue to foster a culture of responsibility among the biologists? Uh, I'd just like to say I think the era of genetically engineering soldiers is decades away. I mean, today we'll have more like pharmaceuticals, brain machine interfaces, equipment, psychological training, and so on. Those are the issues today. Genetic modification of humans is, is decades out there. It's yeah, but, so would, you, far but away. You, would you agree, though, that the policies, the procedures, the mechanisms that we take now for modification now will influence ultimately our culture yes. and the acceptance of those later genetic That's modifications? Right. So we shouldn't sit on our hands. We need to look right. at it proactively, but yeah, it's, we've got time. I guess you know, it's tricky. So, like, what you're describing is, is um, manipulating that guy to make him a super soldier. It would be a uh, semotic. Uh, Little did you know manipulation. that manipulation, right? Exactly. <laughs> you're, you're soon going to be <laughs> super ensign. Right, and it is. Uh, like a, a great book on this is uh, uh, by Sir Ian Wilmot. He's the guy that cloned Dolly the sheep, and and he uh, he's really upfront about how very difficult it is to um, uh, take apart a gene and, and decide which attributes are the ones that are going to result in super intelligence, math skills, you know, um, the ability to quickly pick up another language, this sort of thing. Even though we do know some parts of the brain that are associated with that it's a technical problem, just enormous, absolutely huge, but. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that, getting to your framework point, um, 
that research isn't going to be undertaken and that it isn't even unethical. I mean, if you look at pre-implantation genetic diagnosis now, this is the very beginnings of this, right? Um, and we all agree that we actually want to bring genetic science into reproductive science more. It just results in healthier populations. We can't begin to think about a framework yet where um, uh, we draw a red line between ensuring a healthier population because of the, by using the benefits of genetic science and uh, uh, not making super soldiers. But it seems to me that that line, that test, won't be something that we test in this country. It might be something that another country tests that doesn't have quite the same uh, 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 ethics that we do, but I won't name them or speculate as to which ones. And uh, with that, I hope you guys enjoyed lunch, and uh, please give it up for our panel. Thank you, guys. As far as we know, there's no algae in the lunch, right? Yeah, no algae. Don't worry, you're safe.